Adesanya and Romero is one of these fights that gets a little bit more interesting as each day goes by. As the fight gets closer and closer, like here, let me back you up. When this fight was first announced, people were even resisting the participation of Yoel Romero in the contest, period. And their deduction for deciding that Romero does not belong here is that Romero had a number one contenders match and lost it. Now, I can't push back on that logic. You're welcome to that thought to say Romero doesn't belong here, but there's also something known. K1 used to actually do this. Scott Coker talks about this when he holds Grand Prix. It's called a last man standing clause. So if we do accept that Costa and Romero was the right match for a number one contender, you could argue that match up, down, and sideways, split decision, extremely close, went to Costa. Okay, fine. But if Costa then removes himself, it would appear that Romero is the last man standing. Romero would move forward. It would appear that. So to act as though Romero doesn't belong when he was in a number one contenders match and one half of that isn't present would default back to Romero. So I don't know that I've ever agreed with that logic if you look at the timeline and you look at the history of the division. Either way, that was the belief and therefore Romero doesn't belong. Now, Romero not belonging and Romero not having a possibility of winning are two vastly different topics. And I do have to wonder about the mindset of Izzy going into a fight where he's a meaningful favorite and popular opinion is that he's going to go and whip a guy. And the only reason I question it is it's a spot we have not seen him in before. Every one of Izzy's fights, the deck was stacked against him, in popular opinion. He had nothing to lose, only things to gain. He was a kickboxer. He was new to MMA. He was too long. He had bad takedown defense. His ground game, he wasn't a high enough belt in jujitsu. There was all these questions, and there was all these comments. And night after night and performance after performance, he showed that he got better and he started taking some of those doubts away. He ultimately ended up in a big tussle, turned into a scramble with Kelvin Gatslam. He ended up on bottom. He throws up a triangle, scrambles, gets to his feet, and people go, oh my gosh, this guy knows what to do on the ground. Okay. I only bring this to your attention because a mindset and approach is vastly different. Mindset and approach doesn't really change the outcome on fight night whether you walk in there a little more confident because people think you can do it or you walk out there and you're a little better when people don't think you can do it. it. It does matter, but only slightly. It changes your motivation in your preparation to fight night. If you overlook somebody in your preparation, the will to win is nothing without the will to prepare. I don't have an answer on this for Izzy and I'm not even offering you an opinion. I'm just saying it's a little bit of a different situation. And I do get confused at some of the pushback to the top contenders. I feel this is happening right now with Aldo being given the shot against Cejudo. To act as though Aldo isn't a rightful guy to go and fight for a title on any given night at either 135 or 145 and to just bring up his last couple of matches, I don't know if I agree with that. Most other sports don't fully work that way. The body of work is a relevant factor. It's not the only factor. I'm just saying it, but it's a piece. It's a piece of the pie. I would also push back on anybody that says Jose Aldo does not belong in there. And I would go, okay, great. So you must have bet on Henry Cejudo. Whether it was just a side bet with a buddy or you bet lunch with somebody or you put some money down at the, at, at the window. You must have bet on Cejudo. I mean, if Aldo doesn't belong here, then what you're saying is that Cejudo beats him for sure. And not a lot of people raise their hand and say, yeah, I took that. Okay, so you're saying Aldo doesn't belong here, but you're saying Aldo can win. If Aldo can beat the champion, then in some ways you're saying he belongs here. I get that there's other options. I get the Peter Yans. I get the Corey Sandbergs. Look, I get guys are doing a great job in that division. And there is some up and coming talent that in the short term have done just a fantastic job and definitely deserve their opportunities. I'm not... Speaking to that, and I'm not arguing against them. I'm arguing for Aldo to make believe that Aldo doesn't matter when you're then conceding that Aldo could beat him and win the whole damn thing. It sounds like he matters. We saw this in college football a number of years ago when the NCAA changed to a playoff situation where they elected four teams. 
And they had three teams, and then they had to pick one, and they picked, like, Ohio State that got thrown in there. Ohio State wins the whole damn thing. And so many people were pushing back when Ohio State got nominated. Oh, it should have been Maryland. It should have, should have been Texas. It should have been. But Ohio State won the whole thing. So it sounds like they did matter, and they do belong. And I understand that in MMA, traditionally weak work over the short term. Over your last five fights, this guy has lost. Lost three and won two. He doesn't qualify because this guy won all five. Well, who are they fighting? That is relevant. How did they match up? How did those fights look? Do we agree with the decisions? Were those ranked opponents? Was it five wins over five unranked opponents versus two wins over top five ranked opponents and three losses, but over to they were all championship fights? I mean, I'm just saying there's a, a little bit of a difference there and there's a little bit of a disconnect. And none of these win you the argument, but they are defaults that you do have to look at. And when you're talking about Jose Aldo, to make believe that you can't bring in career, an entire body of work, that doesn't go in line with some other sports. I'll give you an example. Not very many people follow rodeo. So allow me to condescend and assume that you don't follow rodeo. But you can go to the national finals of rodeo. You can finish eighth and win the national finals. Rodeo will look over the year and they will go over who made the most money. Whoever won the most money is the world champion in rodeo, which gets crowned at the completion of the national finals, of which you could have finished eighth in. You could have finished fifth in. You don't even have to win the national finals. The final write-off, you don't have to win to be crowned the champion. And the way the money works, it isn't a negotiated thing like most fees. There are rodeos, the purse is set, the theory believing and encouraging Cowboys to go to the top rodeos, thus keeping them the top rodeos, and whoever leaves with the most money over the course of the year gets crowned the world champion. There was no negotiating. You just went to the biggest rides. You rode against the best on the best animals. Boom, here you go. And there's something that is very real to that. And if you apply some of that logic over to MMA, There's a number of guys who can be the top guys. Look, the boxing model for the longest time was always get a guy, 20 cans, do it at a local smokers and bars that nobody knows that never even makes TVs, but you can now put him on a poster that he's 20 and 0 and fight him for a world championship. That was the boxing model. MMA has made it acceptable to lose. Openly, you're going to fight the best guy. The best are going to fight the best, period. You're going to have an immense likelihood that you're not going to win all of those fights. No problem. The best fight the best. We'll work it out. We'll find out who the top contender is, and the top's going to fight the top. And I don't care if he's got 10 losses, which in boxing terms, if you had 10 losses, you're bum. Your career is over. You're an undercard if you can even get fights, let alone a license to fight. They'll look at you like a bum. They don't favor competition in boxing. They favor records in boxing. It is a miss by boxing promoters, and over a long-term play, it has hurt the sport of boxing. They could have stepped in at any point and educated the fans and put out the message and the narrative that the best are fighting the best. Just like the amateurs, just like the pros, whether you're talking about LeBron or you're talking about Tiger or Sabrina, they don't go undefeated. They don't even go undefeated for a month, let alone a year, let alone a career. They lose all the time. There's peaks and valleys and they get to the playoff and they make sure they have more points than this guy at the right time. It's called peaking. It's strategy. It's competition. It's part of it. But if all you're looking at is a record, so then you're sta- that is now encouraging you to stay away from competition. It's encouraging you to bring in a guy to do the job, to put the guy you want to be the star over. It's pro wrestling at the highest of levels. And even if the competition is real, but the matchmaking is fixed, then the whole thing's a fix. The whole thing's a hustle and a work. It's been a mistake that has happened for the longest period of time that's very unique to the sport of boxing. Nobody ever goes into the World Championships or the Olympic Games or the NCAA or some of the more respected governing bodies of sport on the face of the planet and has to talk about what their record was. Don't don't ask me about what I did yesterday or last week. That competition that we're here to compete for is in an hour. And the only thing that matters is that I have more points than my opponent when time runs out in an hour. That's what we're here to contest. Think about that.